Great. So thank you for listeners. Uh, today's uh, privacy talk is invited uh, Mr. David um, from New York. It was a very honor to have a great talk with him about the futures data business and data responsibilities. I'm very honored to have a talk, uh, Mr. David, today. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I will start to introduce uh, his profiles and backgrounds, and uh, we will start the topics today. So yeah, let me start to introduce him. So David Matson is the CEO and the founders of the CDO Club and the CDO Summit. Matson is the world's leading authority on chief digital and data officers and has been quoted recently by the American banker, CIO.com, CIO Journal, CIO UK, CMS Wire, CNBC, Computer Weekly, Computer World, Deloitte, Ignomica, EdTech Magazine, eMarketers, Peltech Magazine, PRCIO, Company, Financial Times, Forbes, Guardian, Affinum Post, ICAO, McKinsey and Company, Media Post, MIT Strong Management Review, VentureBeat, Wall Street Journal, and ZDNet, among the others. He was a previously founder and street journal managing director of the digital media practice at Chadwick Egg, a premier executive search consultancy named by Business Week as one of the world's most influential headhunters. Madison's book, Be the Media, was featured by the AP in the New York Times after he pre-sold over 5,000 copies in 11 days via his website, Twitter, and on Facebook. He has given a keynote presentation everywhere from Columbia University to United Nations, three times in 2010 from Austin, 10X, uh, South by Southwest, then Amsterdam, Holland, Zagreb, Croatia. So Mr. David, uh, thank you for coming today's uh, private talk, which is the very honor to have a meeting with you today. Thank you, Kosei-san, and konbanwa, uh, assuming in Japan, to my friends in New York and America, ohayo gozaimasu. Yeah, absolutely. Ohayo gozaimasu is just uh, your time there. <laughs> Sunrise. <laughs> yeah, that's very great scene and background. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to Long Beach, New York. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, let's move on to the today's topics. So I want to uh, go to the your activities that related to the CDO crowd today. So you are very amazing uh, actions. Um, it's uh, almost uh, since uh, the area of the 2010s and uh, you had uh, started uh, those activities as well uh, in Japan, Tokyo. I, I had seen the many, many activities, the summit there. They also, it's been a very inspiration to the chief digital officer. They also data officers in Japan. Um, so my question is, uh, I'm very curious the why did you start the CDO crafts? Of course, formerly you started from the LinkedIn based communities through your YouTube channels. I was also very inspired you at those actions. So yeah, why did you start these activities, Mr. David? Thank you, Kohei-san. I started the CDO club while I was still a managing director at a boutique executive search firm in New York City in around uh, 2011. And while I was there, my brief was to uh, find people who were leading uh, executives in digital data and analytics. And I happened to notice through that process that chief digital and chief data officer hires were increasing by dramatic numbers at very large and prestigious organizations. So, you know, you have to pay attention to this when they, you see that number of growth, that, that amount of growth happening so quickly and nobody was really paying attention. And by nobody, I mean really two, two main groups one main group would be the consultants and the uh, research uh, firms like uh, Forrester, Gartner, uh, uh, and others, McKinsey and others. 
And the other big group that should have paid attention was executive recruitment firms, you know, Spencer Stewart, Russell Reynolds, uh, et cetera. They really weren't paying attention to this trend. So what I did was I created a white paper. You know, I, I put a paper together in around 2011, which I presented to a group of CHROs, uh, hiring managers at the Harvard Club in New York City in 2011. And they really encouraged me to keep with my, my, my research. And it was growing so quickly, in fact, that I decided to jump out of Chattachelig and really start the CDO club on my own. And to do that, I started doing events. So we did an event in New York City, our first ever event for CDOs in 2013 at Reuters in New York City. And then uh, the next year we did it again at Reuters in New York and we did one in London at the BBC. And from that point on, you know, every year after that we did uh, probably about an event a month. And it was about two years in when I noticed there was tremendous demand from outside of the United States, uh, especially in Europe and UK and Asia and, uh, and in the Middle East too. We had our first affiliate partner uh, he was 15 years at Ernst & Young as their CIO in Israel, uh, a guy named Amit Kama, and he started the CDO club in Israel. And then through our partnership with June Kamo in uh, Tokyo, Kamo-san started the CDO club in Tokyo in uh, about 2014. And so, you know, it's grown dramatically there. As a matter of fact, sometimes Kamo-san has more uh, attendees at his events in Tokyo than we have in other events in the world. So tremendous amount of interest from all over the world. And it's not just for chief digital officers. The real growth we're seeing is also on chief data officers and chief analytics officers. So, you know, when COVID hit, it wasn't really a big, uh, it wasn't much drama for us in that we've always been a digital group. We've always been online. We were a community first and we didn't have a lot of events planned in the first half of this year in 2020. So we were able to make the transition pretty smoothly. As a matter of fact, uh, this really plays into our strengths by the fact that just about every company now needs to be digital, even this corner 7-Eleven or the noodle shop on the corner is now you know, making deliveries and it was a challenge for them to do that before. Now everybody is doing that and we're seeing this transition that we were trying to push for 10 years uh, is happening everywhere. Even if you look at schools and education and churches, they're all struggling with delivering their services digitally and online instead of physically. So I think uh, Satya Nadella, who is the CEO of Microsoft, he said it best when he said, we've seen two months, uh, two years worth of digital transformation happen in just the last two months. And that's clearly what's happening all over the world. And the demand for chief digital, chief data, chief analytics officers has grown dramatically since January 2020. Yeah, it is a remarkable numbers. I had uh, talked with some uh, digital uh, leadership um, in Japan as well. They had felt those uh, kind of responsibilities uh, are very important to uh, take in a new leadership for the enterprise communities. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about uh, why the community can gain the many numbers because uh, there is, seems to be a many communities or education opportunities related to the digital uh, contents or digital knowledge is, but uh, you are growing the numbers in compared to the others. So what, what is yep. the most critical point those members is coming into your service to your communities? Yeah, I think three, three big things. You know, we do a jobs update every month where we, all month long, we scour the internet to try to find appropriate jobs and people who need CDOs, as well as the third thing, what are CDOs working on? It's called our CDO jobs up, update. And I think um, our community has grown and is very, very cohesive and they help each other because we've helped them. You know, my, my goal as a, a community manager uh, is to fulfill their needs and help them get their jobs done. And I think if we can, as a community, help our members get their jobs done faster, more efficiently, cheaper, by introducing them to new services and new companies and new platforms and new vendors, then we've done our job. So. Uh, but really, one of the drivers of our jobs update is, you know, number one, what companies hired CDOs this month? Number two, what CDOs got hired last month and where did they go? And number three, 
what our CDO is doing all around the world. And I think the last thing, the first two things are important because it really binds them to our community if we've helped them get a career. But the last one, you know, what are other CDOs doing? This is just a great snapshot of what's happening around the world because sometimes CDOs are so busy and so focused, they don't pay attention to what's going on outside of their own company. This is a way for us to share with them what their uh, colleagues are doing and hope that it might give them some insight on how they can do their jobs better. I see. Yeah, I pointed that uh, your activity in Japan is CDO crowd. Um, where I saw this and interviewed the Japanese top leadership uh, who is in charge of a digital transformation in this market, they are struggling to solve the problems, but uh, it's a very big problem here. We are very fewer CDO in this market. We need to more digital uh, transformation and also the digital educations uh, yeah. for the readership. So those, your activity is a uh, very primary actions for uh, the next uh, generations of the companies, not only for the companies, but also the government. So we try to take the leadership in this part from uh, now the Japanese council at this moment. So yeah, this is a very uh, great actions for us as well. Yeah. I think so. I, you know, I was uh, lucky. Uh, Jun Kamo, again, he, he's an incredible leader mm. for the community there. And Kamo-san, maybe three or four years ago, he set up meetings for us to meet with the leadership in, China, in J Japanese government. And we saw their digital plan for the next five years. And it was very, you know, very thick plan. And uh, I was delighted to see that a lot of the government's plan was um, uh, based on, you know, disaster mitigation, um, you know, what happens when tornado hits, when uh, there's a tsunami, what happens if there's an earthquake, how do we efficiently make sure that the lights uh, don't stop people and first responders from getting to disaster areas, how can we efficiently move people from an earthquake area to a safer area, all of these things were really, really big government plans to digitize. And I think focusing on uh, citizen safety, it seems like that was their priority a few years ago. I think now that they've covered that, that most important topic, now we can move on to other really important things like making the tax code simpler, making uh, the ability for everyone to do their taxes online, you know, making life a little bit simpler uh, for uh, citizens to vote and things like this. So I think there's been a tremendous amount of progress. There are some infrastructure issues in Japan that, you know, for example, two big things, right? One is uh, Japanese culture is very rare to give out a C-level title. You know, they, they don't give out C-level titles as uh, easily as they do in uh, Europe or in the States. Uh, the other thing is, you know, there's more males than females that, uh, that inequality can uh, have some challenges in making more people uh, C-level. But having said that, there are a lot of people in Japan who are doing the same role as a chief digital officer or as a chief data officer in other countries, but they may not be called CDO. They may be called something else, like a manager of digital or director mm -hmm. of digital. And these are the things that there's just a nuance in a language that makes it challenging for me. And then it's so much more important to have someone like Kamo-san who understands these uh, cultural differences and can make the adjustments so that we continue to build that community in Asia. Um, yeah, that was very great story. It's a, it's a, a very great meeting with the Kamo-san to start this market. So he knows everything that is cultures, the differences from your countries, but he's uh, trying to assimilate the best practice uh, for those of uh, interest. So that's a very great achievement. Yeah, as a matter of fact, he's just sent me an email this morning. His next uh, Tokyo CDO Summit will be mm -hmm. in December. I'll have more information about that shortly, but very excited to see he did an event this year. He's doing another one. So he has not been slowed down by the crisis of COVID. He's moving forward to make sure we keep uh, communication going with our members. Great. So let's move on to the next topics uh, that's uh, related to your background and histories. I had seen uh, some your uh, stories that you are uh, not only uh, 
for the entrepreneurs is also the philanthropy, uh, which is the uh, very great sympathy with him, with me because the, I've been working on these social sectors before. Uh, in particular, I'm uh, being involved with the educations. Uh, the you are uh, started the home I uh, saw so that the, on the the your information on the web. So what why did you start those activities? Uh, the the philanthropy mindset that uh, this is the uh, very normal or that's unique for you. Yeah, you know, it was around 2008, and I had just published my book, Be the Media, and there was a tremendous amount of disruption in uh, the United States and abroad, but here we had a home, uh, uh, the ownership crisis, where a lot of people uh, were losing their homes in the, during the financial crisis of 2008, and uh, veterans especially, you know, there's a tremendous problem in the United States of homeless veterans. And so my feeling was uh, I should do something, you know, and it was a very difficult time, uh, especially when people are losing their primary residence. So I thought we could do, uh, uh, you know, a benefit. So what we decided to do was a thing called homemade and homemade, you know, uh, very similar to what they did with Live Aid in the UK. And uh, there was someone who was really instrumental in driving Live Aid, and that was Ken Cragen. Uh, Ken Cragen got a call from Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte wanted to help people. It was called USA for Africa. We were really mm. trying to create a moment here in the States where we could support the troubles they were having in Africa. This is 20, 20, 25 years ago. And a guy named Ken Cragen was a big part of that. And Ken has an illustrious history. He managed the Smothers Brothers TV show. He managed Trisha Yearwood. He managed Kenny Rogers, you know, some very famous musicians and, and uh, musical artists. And he decided to, uh, when, when Harry Belafonte called him, Ken decided to do something different. He said, you know, why don't we put out a, a record? Why don't we put out a, a song? And he called it, We Are the World. And mm -hmm. uh, Ken was the one who famously got everyone together. He got, you know, everyone from Bruce Springsteen to Bob Dylan to come together and create this single called We Are the World. Michael Jackson wrote it with Lionel Richie. And, uh, and uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful tribute and, and made you know, a tremendous amount of money. I think it set a record for the amount of money it raised uh, to go help uh, Africa from, from the USA. And I, 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 it struck me that Ken was somebody that I should contact. I never thought I would be able to get a hold of Ken Craig. And, you know, he's such a famous guy, but, you know, he picked up the phone on the first try and we gave it a shot. You know, we tried to do a thing called homemade. Uh, it was a little bit challenging, as I, as I said at that time. But, um, you know, the, uh, I think the, um, the thought was on the right path. And now, of course, we're finding something similar today with COVID. You know, people are, are mm -hmm. really challenged, uh, especially with, uh, with the um, uh, difficulties in getting medical supplies and personal protective equipment. So, you know, having said that, moving from homemade uh, and we are the world uh, to be the media. You know, if you look at my book, Be the Media, it was a very big book. You know, one half of the book was designed. This was published in 2008. And I started the book in 2002. And if you think about it, podcasting had just taken off in the early 2000s. Blogging had just taken off. We really hadn't seen much of YouTube. You know, in those days, in 2008, it was more about Friendster and MySpace than it was about, you know, Facebook. Facebook wasn't really even a, a, a major uh, platform at the time. So uh, the first half of the book was really teaching musicians, filmmakers, authors, publishers, the new ways of doing business in media that you don't need to sign, you know, ridiculous one-sided contracts and get ripped off by the label or the agent or the publisher or the film distributor. You could do all these things on your own and make more money. Of course, now everybody realizes that this isn't, you know, rocket science today, but back in 2008, you know, 10 years ago, this was a major insight. But the reason I bring it up in philanthropy is that was the first half of the book. The whole second half of the book was really dedicated to exploring the importance of nonprofit media. You know, media that you do to help uh, society instead of help a corporation or instead of using media to get rich, this was using media in order to help your fellow man. So even though I published a book on media, you know, clearly half of that book was designed to teach people that media is important. You know, media shouldn't be something that 
you use just to make money or just to make a profit. Uh, media companies have a responsibility to the public to give them timely information that can help them with their lives. So I thought if I'm writing a book, I better not write it all about how to make money using media because that's part of the problem. So I thought I would at least dedicate half of that book mm. to nonprofit media and make sure that people understand the importance of that. I see, that's, uh, yeah, that's amazing, very inspired because uh, I've been using my own social media just uh, promoting my information. So or to somebody I got interest I uh, need you to share. So those are very big powers uh, for the, even the minorities can get the powers through on the social uh, promotions. Uh, I'm curious to, to you publish those book uh, since your first publications, the uh, m media futures or media contents has been changed. Um, maybe just uh, we have uh, spent uh, uh, some decades uh, since you had published. So we had uh, any change of witness since uh, you sold your deer. Yeah, as a matter of fact, today, uh, I, this book was sent to and used by media communications and journalism schools at universities throughout the world. And uh, we were lucky that we were able to get this book into the hands of professors at major universities. And uh, I gave a presentation 10 years ago. It was, uh, tw it was 2010. It was to the University of Nebraska. And they asked me to comment on the state of media. And here we are 10 years later. And on Wednesday, I've been invited back to give a 10-year summary of, of what, what has happened in the last 10 years in all those media fields. So you caught me at a, on a very good day because I've been practicing my speech all night. But I think the problems that we're having have not changed. The owners have just switched, right? So in the past, an author had to get, you know, if you really wanted to get published and get widespread noti you know, notice, you'd have to go through a major uh, publisher. And the problem with those publishers, they would take, you know, 90% of your revenues or 95% of your royalties. Uh, same thing in film distribution, music distribution. Musicians made practically nothing, right, from the major label contracts. Well, what's changed? Well, now everything, uh, musicians are moving to Pandora and Spotify, and it's still a ripoff. It's a major ripoff, you know? Like they put their music up there, and you have to get literally tens of millions of spins. You got to get tens of millions of plays just to make pennies. So the system is just as abusive and just as one-sided as it was before, especially in music. Now, film and books, you know, I mean, in film publishing, the wonderful thing is you've got more than just a few distribution arms. You know, in the past, you only had a couple of networks on television. You only had a couple of major film studios. Great that we had a couple of indies, but it was still a challenge to get independent filmmakers to get widespread notice. Well, now you could put your film up on YouTube. You could put it on Netflix. You've got Amazon. You know, you've still got the majors. You've got a lot of minors. You've got a lot of independents. Uh, same thing in book publishing and in podcasting and in blogging. You don't have to get permission from anyone to create media and to deliver it. And the cost of creating media in every one of those fields has dropped to practically nothing. The cost of distribution has dropped to practically nothing. So why would I complain? What's the problem? Well, the problem is getting attention. Right? Today, to try to get attention is almost impossible because Everyone's a blogger, everyone's a podcaster, everyone can make music, everyone can deliver a film or, or video. So how does one person get attention? And it's almost like you have to buy attention in the marketplace, you know? You can use earned media, you can use paid media. Uh, so I try to be as optimistic about these things as possible. And there are lots of examples of people who become famous on TikTok, for example, by just lip syncing. You don't even need to learn how to play an instrument anymore in order to be a quote unquote musician. I think the real challenge that we're having now and that we'll have going forward are two things. One is how do you get attention? How do you get people to pay attention to you when they're being distracted so easily? Number two, and this is the most important thing, is how do you get paid, right? People are putting in so much time and so much effort into their creativity but they're still having a challenge on getting paid. And you're certainly not going to get paid on Pandora and Spotify unless you're, you know, Bruce Springsteen or Taylor Swift. You're just not going to get enough spins to make any money. So you've got to find your own audience, just like I suggested in the original book. Find your audience, build that audience, and create super fans. 
And I think the real solution to photography and to film and to music and to books will be when we have a fully implemented and scalable blockchain solution where people who are creators can have an audience directly with their fans, but they don't have to go through any middlemen in order to get paid. And that way I can take a photograph that I make and I can put it up online. And if people do use it on their website or they use it on their phone or they use it as a screensaver, there will be an automatic way using you know, uh, 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 contracts in bundled into that blockchain platform where using smart contracts, mm -hmm. you can have independent uh, contractual relationships with people who want to use your photos for uh, uh, paid purposes. So that's my hope, you know. Uh, I think the problem of getting attention is not going to go mm -hmm. away. It's only going to get harder and harder as everyone becomes a media producer. Uh, but I do have hope that down the road there's going to be a more smooth uh, payment infrastructure for transactions. Yeah, that sounds very nice. The, since I've been working on the blockchain space, the direct consumer is the final it needs to the uh, decentralize the distribution. Uh, it's not the need of specific intermediates, which is the, the the very essential approach for the content creators to deliver the, your service to the specific funds or consumers who need the, your direct services. So that's a very great futures uh, the visions to, to yourself. So the last topics about uh, is uh, like uh, data responsibilities, the, the enterprise. Uh, they need to control the digital services, the, the consumer data inside the operations. So what, what kind of the, the responsibilities are required for the chief digital officers, the data officer in the future? Um, are you envisioning this moment? Yeah, uh, for chief digital officers, you know, we've seen a tremendous growth in the hires of these people because now, as we said at the beginning of this session, every company is going through digital transformation. Even if you put it on the back burner, even if you weren't thinking about it, even if you didn't care about it, starting January, February, March, now you have to care. Because if whether you're a church or a religious organization or a mosque or you know, uh, uh, you're giving uh, education in elementary school all the way up through college, uh, you've got to be able, you've got to consider uh, online learning and online education and even uh, remote medicine and uh, telemedicine and remote health, every industry today has been dramatically affected by uh, move the move to online. So I think on the digital side, that's only going to increase. Now the challenge there is how do we get enough talented and uh, professional people into those roles quickly, you know, so that we can execute quickly. On the data side, I would say chief data officers are now struggling with um, increasing privacy governance mm -hmm. and compliance regulations. We've seen a growth, uh, especially in Europe, in the move to uh, have users commit, uh, d decide when and where they should be giving their personal information. So you saw the uh, uh, GDPR legislation, which is a worldwide policy that says that you know people are in charge of uh, email communications. You can't use my email address to send me spam. You know I need to approve that. So. You saw the same thing in California with the California privacy uh, uh, regulations. We're going to see more of that. So the challenge becomes, if, you, if you're an organization, you have 400,000 people in your organization and your sales teams are all over the world, you can't expect your people, you can't have 400,000 privacy experts in your company that know exactly what the rules and regulations are to every email address that you've ever captured and who can get what email uh, from what individual. It just can't be done. You don't have privacy experts in sales or in marketing. So it really requires that chief data officers are focusing on governance and architecture and privacy and security and compliance. Uh, things are just getting more and more complicated. I think we're gonna see a lot more regulations on privacy come about. So how do you make that scalable? That's not easy, but it's doable. Uh, on the analytics side, chief analytics officers, we're seeing even more now that companies are getting their data infrastructure set and deployed. Now, of course, you're layering on top of that infrastructure, people who, who can do real time insights and analytics in order to get the right information to the right people at the right time. 
So the changes we've seen here are dramatic and ongoing. And it reminds me of the MarTech stack, you know, the marketing technology stack about four or five years ago. There were so many platforms for marketing people. People didn't know what to use. There were just so many of them popping up all over. And then there was a lot of M&A and Salesforce bought a bunch and Oracle bought a bunch and Adobe bought a bunch. Uh, right now we're seeing that same glut of tools in the analytics space for chief analytics officers. Uh, and I do believe there's going to be, you know, um, M&A there. There's going to be a lot of roll-ups there, and we'll see the good ones survive and the bad ones disappear. But it, again, it's a challenge for CAOs to figure out, you know, what are the best tools that I can use right now to deploy across the organization to make it easy for everyone to become a citizen analyst, right? That's the real goal is how do you make uh, data analysis so simple that anyone in the organization can do it without having to go to the pros. So I think we're seeing that evolution take place as well, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, that's a very, um, the new shift dynamic um, change in the laws of uh, digital officers. Uh, it's a very data complex is at this moment. There are also the many things that happens at this moment, not only for the data privacy, but also we need to consider how we can use the data on the realities. So those issues need to be acquired on those parts of the responsibilities, how they can take it to lead the team to make a great success to, to create a benefit. So those are very big challenges for all of them. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. So lastly, uh, I'm very happy to be given the listeners, the Japanese listeners, uh, the message from you. Uh, you have uh, organized the uh, CDO Japan crowd as well. So please uh, give a message uh, for those listeners. Yeah, I think these are challenging times. There's no doubt. We're undergoing a global shift in uh, not only the way that we do business, but also the way that we live. And I think the Japanese culture and Japanese society and the professionals and individuals in Japan are going to excel in this type of an, of an environment because they're already prepared. They already have great education, good sense of numbers. So for data and analytics, we're seeing a lot of skills and talented professionals come out of Asia. I think that's only going to increase. I think that in the past as well, we've seen the Japanese uh, accept hardship and overcome them uh, much more easily than other countries and other societies. So again, I think the uh, Japanese government did a great job four or five years ago in planning for disaster relief uh, for earthquakes and hurricanes and tsunamis. That plan was already dictated and in place and being deployed four or five years ago. So I think now the next step for Japanese society is really just to you know, take that as the next step in evolution and really make life easier for people to get things done uh, by doing everything from home, whether it's, you know, renewing your driver's license or, you know, getting a permit, uh, getting a license to open up a shop or uh, uh, a, a new company. Uh, these are all things that, you know, I think will, although there is disruption now, I think that the bigger picture for this is these are all things that we as a society needed to do. We needed to cut down our reliance on commuting and traffic and noise and oil and gas reliance, more towards uh, work from home and from shopping and remote health and telemedicine. All of these things I think have a future long-term benefit. The disruption that we're finding today is only temporary, but I, I hope that long-term we'll get a hold of this pandemic, uh, get the vaccine out. I don't look forward to a day where we return to normal, Kohei-san, I hope you don't mind me saying that. I think normal over the last 10 or 20 years, we were heading towards uh, mutual destruction. You know, uh, we were not heading in the right direction as far as, um, you know, energy consumption and things like this. So maybe this is a positive note. You know, the, this temporary disruption has forced us to become better people, better citizens, uh, better colleagues. So uh, that's, again, you know, my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, again, if history is any indication of uh, future uh, activity, I, I think the Japanese society will pull out of this really strongly and come out of it a much stronger uh, society. And I, I hope the rest of the world uh, does the same. So, yeah, that's a very great message. That it's a time to collaborate, not just uh, one single countries where 
it's a timing to uh, take it hands together to fight against this um, uh, unprecedented uh, the pandemic, but we can overcome uh, because uh, we are in the same. So yeah, thank you for uh, yeah, joining us today. Uh, as uh, Ken Craig and as Ken Craig would say, we are the world, right? No, I mean, no, absolutely. We're, we're all in this together. So it's a great, a great, uh, you know, uh, opportunity I think for us mm. all to put aside our differences and work together to save the planet and save each other. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for uh, joining today's interview, uh, Mr. David. I'm very glad to have a talk with you. The, uh, it's appreciated for all the listeners. Thank you for today. Thank you, Kohei-san, and thanks to all your colleagues. Thank you.